So this presentation is going to show up in a lot of weeks and it's the same presentation each week. It's just for easy access. So that way you don't have to go back to say like week one to find the same information. Um, I'd also like to specify that this information came from a different instructor, Ms. Uh, Karen Kaiser, who created this documentation and I've manipulated it, it into a presentation uh, form. But you also have the original PDF document in, in the pages as well. So um, post-colonial themes. Our first one is identity. Identity is, of course, the way a person sees him or herself. This is a huge category, including a, person per a person's perceived role in society, a person's sense of their own value, and specific factors like ethnicity, nationality, and personality traits. For post-colonial theory, identity is extremely complex. In colonial relationships, the colonizer uses the colonized to define its identity. For example, for the European, Europe is whatever Africa isn't. The other becomes crucial for self-definition, helping the colonizer draw boundaries to shape its own self-image. On the other hand, the other can experience a significant disruption in or even loss of identity as a result of contact with the colonizer. This sometimes means that the colonized people internalize the idea that they are less than because an outside group is placing itself above them. The way the colonizing power sees themselves becomes the way they, the colonized, see themselves. Rather than feeling proud of or strongly identifying with their cultural traditions, they may begin to feel ashamed of those traditions. This can affect how indigenous people feel about their appearance, their religion, their family structure, their knowledge. All of these elements are important for identity. It's important to remember that this can happen whether the colonizer is good or not. The colonial powers can have the best intentions, but tucked away in the colonial process is this hierarchy. If the colonized needs help from the colonizer, they must be less than the colonizer. Even if the colonizer gives practical, useful, genuinely good help, there's still a disruption of identity. For both the colonized and the colonizer, the strengthening or blurring of identity can happen on an individual level, a national level, or every level in between. Next up, we have otherness. Otherness can be thought of as the quality of being another. It's the quality of being different, of not belonging, of being labeled an outsider, of being pushed to the margins of a culture. You might also run into the word othering, which means the process of labeling a person or group as an other. If you run across the term alterity in outside reading, it is more or less a synonym of otherness. As you can imagine, this category involves a lot. The label of other can mean that a person is treated as A, an object of pity that needs instruction or help to be brought to the dominant or civilized group, or B, an object of fear and disgust that should be continually shunned and excluded. For scholar Hami Bahaba, the other is stuck in the impossible position of being regarded in both ways at the same time. An other can be taught to mimic and outwardly adopt a colonizer's way of life, but that will always be seen on some level as an act. He explains how colonized groups who begin to mimic colonizers end up being almost the same, but not quite. That comes from his work um, published in 2004 on page 123. Bahaba argues that whether the dominant group is aware of this, the other is set up to fail because it cannot truly be welcomed and accepted as equal to the colonizer. After all, what happens when the other is no longer the other? How would the dominant group be able to define itself? Another aspect of otherness is that the differences between the label don't necessarily reflect reality. That is, the other might not actually have any of the behaviors or beliefs that the dominant group says they do. It may be that those behaviors or beliefs are simply stereotypes, characteristics that apply to some but not all members of the group. A great example of this is cannibalism. One of the works we read, Heart of Darkness, is going to reference cannibalism and the idea that these people in, in Africa are savages and they're cannibals. When we know um, through so much study that there has never actually been a cannibalistic society in that a group of people, as far as we know in human history, has never subsided solely on human flesh. If there are cannibalistic rituals, it is a ritual of religious importance and it's not something that anyone takes pride or joy in. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Remember that for Heart of Darkness. Um, 
Otherness means that people can end up being defined by the fears or assumptions of the dominant group rather than by what they actually do or believe. Examining otherness includes analyzing how and why the us-other boundary is maintained. How are the labels reinforced? What is at stake for the dominant group? What burdens does otherness create for those who are excluded? Um, that quote from Bahaba comes from the location of culture. It was published in New York, New York by Rutledge Publishing. Race is an obvious but important theme for post-colonial theory. Race can be used as a unifying factor in colonization, usually in the sense of uniting one race against another. Often in colonization, indigenous people are lumped into one racial category by colonizers, ignoring differences in ethnicity. For example, in Heart of Darkness, it is set in the Congo, which has hundreds of ethnic, hundreds of ethnic groups, but these ethnic and cultural differences are not acknowledged in the story. Postcolonial theorists are also very interested in how cultural meaning can be attached to race. When looking at literature, they might investigate the ways that internal characteristics are culturally associated with external characteristics like race. For example, how are racial differences in literature conflated with differences in how educated, intelligent, hardworking, reasonable, or civilized people are? It's important to note that these dynamics can be seen in the relationship between colonizers and native people, but they can also be seen among colonized people who could create their own racial hierarchies and assign their own cultural meaning to racial differences. It's also possible, of course, that the literature is critiquing and resisting these race-based labels. Analyzing race in literature means investigating how race functions as a point of difference or unity. To what extent is the oppression or labeling in the story connected to race? How is racial difference portrayed in the literature and what importance is it given? It's important not just to find examples, but also draw conclusions about what messages the writing sends through these examples. Class. Like race, class is a category of difference. Class relationships are very similar to us other relationships because those outside of one's own class are necessarily others. In the post-colonial era, era, after formal colonies gained independence from colonial powers, class systems emerged that were deeply tied to colonial history. For instance, some class differences in former colonies is connected to religious or racial differences that may have played a significant role in the colonial era. In the literature, look for ways that significant, I'm sorry, look for ways that class differences could be the result of colonization. Also, class distinctions are somewhat part of how colonizers justify colonization or how powerful people justify the continuation of their power. This is usually based on the colonizer's belief in inherent and correct method of dividing people into different social classes. How are the different social classes defined as depicted in the text? How might being of a higher class grant people power? Of course, in the works we're reading, the author could be criticizing or re resisting class distinctions. What is the ultimate message about class in the literature, and how does that relate to colonial relationships and colon colonial practices? That is a question we want to be considering when we're reading our works. In post-colonial analysis, investigating the theme of language does not mean looking at the imagery or tone of writing. These are features of language, of course, and they are important to note in an analysis, but we want to focus on the broader concept of a language as a part of the culture. Language is a significant theme in post-colonial theory, in part because of the language of the colonizing power is given a special privilege over native language. In colonization, indigenous people are sometimes taught to regard their own language as inferior to the colonizer's language. Because language plays such a massive role in how we experience, interpret, and interact with the world, the importance of language really cannot be overstated. Applying at the theme of language means that means identifying what language practices are portrayed in the writing. Obviously, everything we're going to read this term will be in English. This is an issue of practicality because English is our shared language in the class, but it's no accident that a lot of literature by formerly colonized people is written in English. English is a language that many, many colonized people inherited as a result of colonization. The often painful history behind the widespread use of English can make for very complicated relationships to the language. In the process of colonization, how are colonized people taught to regard their own language? For those a generation or two removed from colonization, how do they regard the native language as well as English? Especially later in the term, we'll see native languages mixed in with English in several stories.
For the theme of language, look for the way that each author chooses to use language. What is translated, what is not translated, and what seems to be the ultimate message of those choices. The absence of a shared language between a colonial power and a colonizer can make nuanced communication impossible, which has a wide variety of effects for both groups. Does the literature include depictions of teaching or learning languages? What is the right language to use? How does language help colonizers maintain control? How does language help people resist colonization? All of these questions are important for an analysis. There are many different forms of repression that appear in the literature we'll cover, some more obvious than others. Slavery is a clear example of this theme, but it's important to be attentive to more subtle forms of physical, emotional, and social oppression. For example, in the us-other relationship, the us generally insists on speaking for the other instead of letting the other have its own voice and control its own destiny. For postcolonial theorists, this silencing can be considered a form of oppression. Examining oppression in the literature means asking how it was allowed to begin. What initially justified the oppression? Since it began, how has it been able to continue? One way to think of oppression is a cycle. Oppression begets oppression. Postcolonial scholars like Franz Fanon identify the effects that oppression can have on those who experience it, pointing out how oppression oppressed people internalize oppression to ultimately see themselves as worthy of negative treatment. This can ultimately separate an oppressed person from power, keeping them at the bottom of the hierarchy indefinitely. Is this depicted in the literature? What other effects are portrayed by the author? It's quite easy to find examples of oppression, but analyzing oppression means going well beyond pointing out examples. Consider this enormous question. What role does oppression play in colonial relationships or us other relationships. Some of our literature will have more pointed message about oppression, seeking to criticize, complicate, and ultimately resist it. What is a particular context for that resistance, and how might an author be advocating for the end of oppression in the story? Suppression, which is similar to oppression in the effects it can have on the less powerful person or group. Suppression takes place in colonial relationships when the colonized people are made to suppress their own traditions and cultural practices to conform to the colonizer's way of life. This often means that the voice of the other is silenced, limiting or perhaps eliminating the other's power and influence. When most of us imagine suppressing thoughts or behaviors in ourselves, the reasoning is usually that the thoughts or behaviors are inferior, unacceptable, or even dangerous. By the same token, when the other is encouraged to suppress something, it involves a subtle or not so subtle message that the thought or behavior is inferior, unacceptable, or dangerous. How does this process affect both the people who are suppressed and those who are doing the suppressing? How are they made to feel about their respective ways of life? Specifically, what do colonized people gain by suppressing and what do they lose? The writer Memi, 1991, addresses the consequences of suppression in the book The Colonizer and the Colonized. Quoted, the most serious blow suffered by the colonized is being removed from history and from community. That quote can be found on page 91 of The Colonizer and Colonized. Many postcolonial scholars are interested in how suppression of native traditions and beliefs lead to a kind of eraser of native peoples. In this aspect of suppression visible in, is this aspect of suppression visible in literature? This is also connected to the way suppression enables colonization to continue. An analysis of this theme involves looking deeply at the connections to make broader conclusions about suppression and colonization. Think about how the literature may also be advocating for the idea end of suppression. What is the context of this message apparent in the story? Hybridity. Hybridity is very related to identity. Essentially, hybridity is a mixture of more than one cultural perspective or worldview. It can be seen in individual people as well as in groups of people. These different worldviews are often in opposition and thus difficult for the individual or group to reconcile. For example, a person who was born and raised in, Euro in a European colony in Africa may internalize the values and beliefs of the colonial power as well as those of the native tradition. This makes for a hybrid identity that may involve internal conflict. Another form of hybridity can be seen, for instance, in the Caribbean. The colonial era saw Europeans bringing non-native colonized people into the Caribbean, resulting in a great deal of ethnic and cultural diversity. As one of the effects of colonization, this hybridity has meant many advantages and disadvantages. 
Analyzing hybridity as a theme means considering how different cultures are mixed together and what effects it has on those who exist at the intersections. Which aspects are particularly challenging? Language, religion, social customs, etc. Which cultural tradition is correct? And to what extent is somebody pressured to choose? For some scholars, Bahaba, for example, hybridity is a way to overcome the effects of colonization by denying the idea that one way of life should be treated as worthwhile. However, there are obviously many ways to view this theme. What is the message that you see in the text? This is not a one-on-one -on -one situation or a one-to-one -one situation, but it may be useful here to consider the words of Lahiri, an Indian-American woman who was born in London and moved to America at the age of two. In My Two Lives, the author writes, According to my parents, I am not American, nor would I ever be, no matter how hard I tried. I felt doomed by the pronouncement, misunderstood and gradually defiant. In spite of the first lessons of arithmetic, one plus one did not equal two, but zero. My conflicting selves always canceling each other out. As I approach middle age, one plus one equals two, both in my work and in my daily existence. The traditions on either side dwell in me like siblings, still occasionally sparring, one outshining the other depending on the day, but like siblings they are intimately familiar with one another, forgiving and intertwined. In the literature, is hybridity portrayed in a positive or negative light? How is this part of the author's message about colonization? That quote from Lahiri was published on March 6th in 2006 from her article, My Two Lives, published in Newsweek. There is a link in the notes sections of the presentation if you want to access it. Imperialism can be tricky because of its broad definition. Of course, imperialism includes the literature, literal practice of one country taking control of and absorbing another geographic region to expend its own power and influence. Expand its own power and influence. We will see many references to this form of imperialism in our readings for the term, but we will also de but we will also see depictions of softer forms of imperialism. In any circumstance where one culture has more power than the other culture, the dominant culture's values and traditions have a way of creeping into the less powerful culture. It's important to remember that while imperialism can have serious negative effects, it certainly does not have to be a, mal a malicious enterprise. As a matter of fact, cultural imperialism can even include how Western fast food chains have expanded into cities like Kyoto, Japan. So some forms of imperialism are more or less the natural result of uneven cultural influence, while others are a much more intentional or even odious assertion of power. Whichever form of, post of imperialism is depicted in the literature, it can be thought of as a result of uneven power relationships. Given this pattern, analyzing imperialism means considering what circumstances helped create those power relationships in the first place. How is one culture able to heavily influence or even overtake the other? Does the literature depict this? Because postal colonial theory is also concerned with the processes the process former colonies go through to gain independence, an analysis of this theme could also involve examining how a newly independent people can build a separate identity and reverse the results of imperialism. In literature, in literature that depicts this process, how do people go about undoing the work of imperialism? Is it possible? It could be worthwhile to unpack whatever message about this may be below the surface in the writing. We're almost done, I promise. The single most important thing to remember about the theme of being civilized versus uncivilized is that postcolonial theorists do not take these labels at face value. For a postcolonial analysis, we are expected, as best as we can, to set aside our own cultural understanding of what civilized or of what is civilized or uncivilized. This will be key with the Gilgamesh for you guys, just key. This does not say that theorists find it absolutely wrong or problematic to categorize or evaluate behavior. This is merely to say that exploring the why and how these, label, how these labels means approaching them as objectively as possible. After all, who would consider their own behavior to be uncivilized? This is part of why labels are worth investigating in the first place. In the literature that we'll be reading this term, there is always a person or group who is labeled as uncivilized. Generally, the writing is from the viewpoint of the colonizer, and the literature will present these labels as accurate. If the writing is, the form, is from the viewpoint of the colonized, the literature will often show how these labels are misapplied. 
An analysis for this scene means considering how the author approaches these labels and how they are tools either to justify or critique the colonial process. We're going to find a lot of critiques of the colonial process when we get into our short stories and poetries in week seven and eight. It is notable that this label is usually not given to an individual person, but to an entire group of people. Analyzing literature means closely examining specific word choice, so it's worthwhile to think about what words like uncivilized, savage, and barbaric actually mean, as well as what real-world consequences they may have. In terms of connotation, these words are, dis are associated with the idea of being animalistic or less than human. This means that those who are uncivilized get placed below those who are civilized on the scale of humanity. Regardless of whether the labeler has kind or commendable attentions, the connotation still ought to be considered in an analysis. When a colonizer uses these terms, it's like they're saying, hey, this person needs to be taught how to live like a real human being and I'm just the person for the job. Related to this, how does labeling a person or group as other imply that the group or person is less civilized? When you explore this theme, there are several useful questions. How are these labels applied or possibly misapplied? How might the story to make the reader question the definitions of civilized and uncivilized? How do these labels hurt or help people in a practical or outward sense or in a personal or inward sense? What does all of this ultimately say about the colonial relationships? Diaspora refers to people being displaced from their home country their home country, region, or migrating from their home country, region by choice. In either scenario, it applies to larger scale movement and dispersion of native people. Although postcolonial theory tends to focus on diaspora as a result of colonization or decolonization, it can also be thought of as a result of more modern economic scenarios like migrant labor. Scholars identify and analyze particular instances of diaspora, such as the Irish diaspora or Muslim diaspora. This theme raises questions about what it means to belong to a place or culture. Analyzing diaspora involves picking apart the various causes of a movement or displacement as well as exploring its effects. It can mean investigating the concept of assimilation, why, how people assimilate, what the choice represents, or to what extent, or the extent to which it's a choice at all. This theme relates strongly to identity and hybridity since one of the main questions is how people do or do not maintain the cultural practices and identities of their home while in a new place. People may embrace a new culture, reject the new culture, merge the two cultures, or any combination. As you can imagine, there are loads of factors involved in how people respond to displacement both as group and as individuals. Several questions about homelands and borders can also guide an analysis of this theme. What role does the concept of a homeland play in unifying or dividing groups of people? What role do borders play in sectioning off peoples and cultures? What differences for those who exist on both literal and what happens for those who exist on both literal and metaphorical borders? Globalization. So this is a term that people throw around a lot without necessarily defining it especially today. In general terms, globalization refers to the increasing exchange of ideas of both goods and ideas within the international community. It's the idea that the world has become smaller and that we have more intercultural communication and trade. Globalization often denotes intercultural exchange and influence in a business sense, but it operates on a more fundamental cultural level as well. For postcolonial theory, globalization can come in as a theme with regards to how colonizing and decolonizing other countries has paved the way for a globalized world. How do, do the relationship dynamics shift once a colony gains independence? For instance, former colonies can be, still be economically dependent on their former colonizers. A central point of debate, a debate is whether globalization represents a shift toward a flatter, more equal world, or whether globalization presents a continuation of economic inequity. Postcolonial scholars point out that countries that grew wealthier and more influential through a history of colonialism end up having an edge in the globalized world. In this way, the theme of globalization is linked to the theme of imperialism. With cultural exchange, Globalization can also mean that people come to see themselves as citizens of the world rather than primarily citizens of a particular country.
People more often work, study, and live in foreign countries, which affects their relationship with their home country culture, as well as their attitude toward the broader world. What's lost and gained in that trend? Furthermore, cultural exchange exists between, alongside economic exchange. Consider how Hollywood films export American culture, which is a slippery term, while at the same time selling a product. In that context, globalization has meant that blockbuster films are scripted, cast, and shot with a global audience in mind, integrating characters or settings from the largest foreign market, China for instance, to increase appeal and ticket sales within those regions. This weaves a tangled web of cultural influence and exchange. And that is the end of this presentation. Congratulations, you made it through the whole thing. None of the other presentations will be this long, so, you know, don't worry about that again. Thanks.